welcome to today's Intelligent Property Investor Masterclass. I've got a very interesting one for you this week. Now, of course, the reason I'm doing these is so that you can understand what's happening more about Australia and the economy, but as it flows through to property. Because there's a lot of fear mongering out there. There's a lot of stuff in the mainstream media that you could get very, very um, uptight about and insecure about and all of those things. Well, I want to set some of that straight this week, this, like today, because um, the, the, particularly around interest rates. But anyway, let's get into it. So what am I going to be covering? I'm going to be covering the safety switch that is actually going to hinder some of the rate rises that are being talked about at the moment. I also want to talk about China and what's going on over there with their uh, you know, zero COVID policy and how that flows through to us, believe it or not, and how it flows through to property and why that actually affects our commodity prices. So I'm also going to be talking about uh, Melbourne and Brisbane particularly because there's been a big flow of population and that's going to affect property as well. And why there are 500 billion reasons why rates won't rise anywhere near as much as people think. And the RBA knows it. So look, if you're listening to me in any one of the podcast platforms like iTunes or Spotify, please make sure you come across to my website at some stage. It's iloverealestate.tv. Now, the reason I want you to do that is because not only have I got all the slides here that I'm going to be sharing with you, and there's a lot of charts which I think you're going to have to, you're going to want to review, um, but there's a lot of other really good information for you and free stuff and all sorts of things on my website. So jump across there, iloverealestate.tv. Okay, is China already in recession? Well, I don't know whether you've seen what's going on over there, but China has this zero COVID policy. And when China has a policy, they belt you around the ears to enforce it. And that's basically what's happening now, particularly in Shanghai. And now it's moving very much through to uh, Beijing. So the big story is the second half of the year which would be when China could go into recession. Now, you might hear that and go, oh, my goodness, that's going to be really, really bad. Well, in actual fact, it's not. Because what happens, and this has happened every time in history, when things start to get a little bit dire in China, what do they do? They spend their way out of it. Now, that means a lot more infrastructure, a lot more government spending, which means a lot more need for commodities. And the good news for that is we are the commodity country. Now, it doesn't really matter whether they buy it directly from us or they buy it from somebody else. What it does is it pushes up the world pricing of those commodities. And if they're taking the, uh, you know, the iron ore or the coal or the whatever else from somewhere else, well, whoever was previously buying off that somewhere else will uh, certainly not have the, the restrictions on Australia that perhaps China has. So overall, it affects Australia. And it affects Australia in a very good way. Now, when we have uh, a healthier economy, when we have a richer economy, what happens is um, that flows through to property pricing. So let's have a look at that. Here are the commodity prices, um, which is all commodities. And you can see there how, how the commodity prices are really, um, uh, you know, they've been bumping along pretty much in line with the Australian dollar. Now, the commodity price is really, really sore, uh, even though it hasn't shown it there in that chart. The, the Australian dollar will also strengthen. So these are our terms of trade, and you can see there we are up as high as we were, uh, you know, back in 2009, 2010, those kind of time frames. So it really is in a, you know, a really strong position from an Australian perspective. But this is what's going on in Shanghai. Now, look, they're locking people in their, in their big, tall buildings. They've had, uh, you know, everyone banging their pots and pans at a certain time of night and all of this kind of stuff. And it's because of this uh, zero COVID policy. Now, the COVID we have today is not the COVID that we started with back in 2020. It's muta mutated and it's migrated and all these other things, which has actually lessened its um, death toll. Uh, now, look, I'm not medical, but here's, here are just the economic side effects of all of that. You can see in this chart how 
um, COVID cases in China have absolutely soared. That's that little green bit there. Now, the bluey black bit at the bottom is what they were um, when, uh, you know, the, the, sorry, that's a, the confirmed cases, but the, um, the estimated cases are absolutely way, way above that. And you can see here, um, this is the number of high and mid-risk uh, districts, both, um, both decreased in recent days, but they're still really, really high to where they were, say, you know, six months ago or a year ago. And that's affecting all sorts of things in China. One of the big ones is tourism. Now, tourism is down 39% um, from where it was pre-COVID. So when you put somebody in a lockdown, obviously they're not traveling, they're not spending money and all the rest of it. And the way that China has been reacting to everything and the, uh, you know, the globe has been looking in, they're not getting international tourists either. I mean, would you go there for tourism at right now? and maybe get locked in your hotel room for goodness knows how long. So tourism has been massively affected, and it's one of their major industries, albeit internal tourism, massive, but obviously the uh, international tourism, is, uh, it's gone as well. This shows you the uh, business index, now business management managers index. Now the reason I want to show you this is because this gives you a really good insight into how business owners are viewing what's going on and they're very, very pessimistic. So they're not placing forward orders. They're not getting out there and, and uh, investing in their businesses or investing in capital equipment or employing more people or anything. Their outlook is very, very dire. So uh, you can see there when the pandemic broke out in, uh, in 2020, um, obviously everything stopped and everything was terrible. Um, well, with the, in China, they're nearly down to those levels. So, you know, Evergra Ever Evergrande was one of the first building companies in China to go under. And uh, the reason I'm talking about property in China is because it's, it is a big industry in, in China. And because of it hasn't actually, Evergrande hasn't actually gone bankrupt yet, but they're just kind of limping along. But what it, it has done is it's given a lot of instability into the market and people aren't willing to invest in a new apartment or anything else in, uh, in China because of this, um, you know, the, the fear that the developer will actually go broke. Now, that is slowing down the economy tremendously as well. And uh, this is the uh, property transactions volume. You can see there it is 46% down on what it was um, in 2021. Now, that's, that's even, you know, that's, that's not pre-COVID. That's just even 2021. So all these things mean that China's in a little bit of turmoil. Um, it's, it could well go into recession with all of these factors compounding. And if it does, um, or even if, if it just slows, the uh, government will get out there and start infrastructure spending. As soon as it does that, commodity prices will go up and Australia will benefit. Our balance of trade will go up, regardless of whether China's buying it or whoever they're buying it from, their previous buyers are now buying it from us. So I hope you kind of get the big picture there because uh, all of that then flows through to Australia. Australia's got more jobs, make more money, all the rest of it, and that flows through to the property market here in Australia. So roundabout way of saying there is an added strength in the property market here in Australia. Now, the other thing about this is, um, and, and look, I, I sound like a lawyer when I'm saying this because I'm talking about all the bad stuff in the world. Ukraine and what's happening with Russia. Horrible humanitarian stuff going on. Terrible, terrible, terrible. But economically, it's good for Australia because um, Russia is a primary producer. So when they're out of action and all the sanctions are in place and whatever else, Australia uh, is, uh, I, I, you know, is the go-to, one of the go-to people that, you know, to supply all of these um, raw materials. Now, if the war in the Ukraine starts to settle down and they have peace talks or whatever else, uh, it'll be, the, the benefit to Australia will be backed up by what's happening here in China. Even if they don't go into a technical recession, the fact that the whole markets are slowing and it's very, very prominent will be good for Australia, particularly Australian property. So what is this secret safety switch stopping the hikes in interest rates? 
Okay. Markets are currently pricing in 13 rate hikes over the next 18 months. Now, this is totally unrealistic. Super low uh, fixed rates are expiring, which means we already have some of those rate hikes in practice. Because when we, you know, a year ago, two years ago, people with a really low interest rate, they fixed their interest loans. Well, those are coming up for expiry right now. So they're going to either a variable, which is higher than what they had, or they're going for another fixed, which will still be higher than what they had. So that, in effect, is, is um, countering the Reserve Bank of Australia actually int increasing interest rates because of all of these loans that are coming, fixed interest rate loans that are coming due and coming up for, for renewal. So the RBA will factor this in. And it won't hike rates aggressively post-normalisation. Now, I got there, if at all. I feel that it will go up a little bit, but it's not going to go up anywhere near what mainstream media is scaring you into. And that scaring you into uh, inaction, effectively, is stopping you from making money. Because there is such strength in the property market that if you're going to sit on the sidelines and not take action, you're actually missing out. So all of this hype around interest rates and fear mongering and everything else that's going on is actually hurting you if you let it. So this is the, um, this is the predictions that the, uh, the market is pricing into everything at the moment, which is totally unrealistic. If this happened in interest rates, then we would be have the highest interest rates of all interest rates in the world, which is totally, absolutely ludicrous. So it's going to be a lot more moderate. I believe there will be interest rate hikes, but it's not going to be anywhere near what the market is actually pricing in. And it's, it's really about this repricing in the market because of all of those loans that, have, um, that, are, that are coming up for renewal or have come up for renewal, that's already creating an interest rate higher than what we have seen. It's kind of flying under the radar, if you like, but that's actually having a massive impact. You can see here how the fixed rates have gone up. Now, these are what's being offered by the banks at the moment, whether you go a one-year fix, a two-year fix, a three-year fix, a five-year fix, a four-year fix. I think I lost one in the middle there. Um, you can see how the interest rates have gone up there. But look where they are. They're still exceptionally, exceptionally low. So there's a bit of a chart put out here um, of, uh, you know, the median house price and, uh, and how... The, the kind of rates that they're talking about would affect things, and it's scaring people. But this chart here is showing that the, um, these are the number of fixed rate home loans that are coming due, and when they're coming due. You can just see the volume as that comes flows through. So uh, that, in effect, will increase the interest rate paid by the vast majority of people, particularly those who've got fixed interest rates, um, and uh, that will have a compounding effect. So the, the RBA the RBA is not stupid. You know, they're going to take this into account. And that is why a lot of the, the commentators in mainstream media at the moment are just running on fear and, and hype. And I'm, I'm so against it. The other thing that's actually happening is there's a lot of um, competition in the mortgage industry right now. You know, there's been a, a, a relatively easy ability for uh, banks to get their hands on money to relend in the open markets and that extra competition is actually keeping mortgage rates down particularly for uh, new mortgages so what that means is if you're sitting there on an old mortgage or perhaps a, a mortgage that's coming out of fixed rates shop around get out there have a good look around because the reality is you probably get a better deal by moving your home loans. Now, I know that's a pain in the neck. I know it takes an awful lot of rigmarole to actually uh, move your home loan, particularly if you're an investor like I am and you've got a swag of properties that are, you know, all got to be taken into account with a new lender and all that kind of stuff. But it could be worth it for you. So the big four banks, their average um, variable rate, you can see it's come down since the, uh, since the, the since through COVID. Um, and, you know, that's, that's um, 
we are very, very low. So interest rates are going to go up. True. But they're not going to go up anywhere near what the fear is out there in the market. So Melbourne's loss is Brisbane's gain. There's a massive movement from uh, the southern states, but particularly Melbourne, into, uh, into Brisbane. So I'm going to show you some population data now. And population data shows that Melbourne is losing people while Brisbane is picking them up. Now, this is about to uh, collapse uh, in international immigration as well as uh, the increase city by city flow. So let's have a look at, at, at what that means. Look at the red line. The red line is Melbourne. And that is the loss in population that they have had <coughs> since COVID started. <coughs> I have been whinging about all the, uh, the very aggressive um, laws that have been put in place down there by your state government. Well, this is the result. And people are, are, are making that move. Um, you can see there that uh, Sydney have also uh, reduced. And this is the population change. Now, not all of that is into, into Brisbane, obviously. But a lot of it is actually uh, leaving uh, the capital cities to go back to wherever people came from. For instance, there's a lot of migrants that, were, that weren't Australian citizens but were living in the varying cities, Sydney and Melbourne particularly, that have gone back overseas as well. So this is the, um, you can see there on a state-by-state -state basis, I think this actually shows you more dramatically than by city. And you, whilst Melbourne started to turn around a little bit with the, the uh, you know, easing of some of the restrictions, you can see there that uh, you know, the, it, it had a massive catch-up before it's going to be anywhere near what it actually was. Now, how does that translate to property? Well, let me tell you about that in a minute. I want to show you some more charts first. So population growth, now this was the third quarter of uh, 2021. You can see there how um, New South Wales lost a few, but not very many. Um, in that quarter, uh, 6,000 people left, uh, left Victoria because this is obviously you know, lockdown territory as well. 19,000 moved into Queensland. Uh, 3,000 moved into WA. SA lost 600, nothing really. Um, and uh, nationally, we're actually up 12,000. So when you put this over the whole pandemic period, you can see there that the big losses have come from Victoria. 50,000 people have moved out of Victoria. Now, obviously, there's people coming back from overseas and other things as well. Uh, and you can see there New South Wales has had a net growth of nearly 20,000. Queensland has had a net growth of 65,000 people. WA, nearly 21,000 people. SA, pretty consistent there with 2,500. And overall, nationally, we have gained 56,000 people. That is a drop in the ocean compared to what's going to happen when we open up those borders. We have had an overall net migration, as you can see there, with all the um, you know, population leaving. And when we open up the borders again to somewhere around the 200, 300, 400,000 people, which is not unrealistic, we've had that in the past, of migrants coming into this country, where are they going to go? They're actually going to go to Sydney and Melbourne first and then they'll start to go elsewhere. So you can see here how many people we lost um, in the varying jurisdictions. So capital cities lost 84,000 migrants in total. Um, and, uh, and the regions lost about 5,000. So overall, we lost about 90,000 people. But who lost the most? Victoria. 54,000 people leaving Victoria. And the largest gain you can see here from uh, migration by jurisdiction is actually um, Queensland. So regionals, uh, you know, there's two things happening in the regional areas. One is that um, the younger people aren't actually leaving the regions to go to the city. So they're holding on to a lot of their population, which previously they haven't. And the second thing is there's been a lot of tree change, sea change, all of those kind of things. So uh, whilst there was a massive rush out of the cities when COVID started, it's been bobbing up and down. But basically, it's at a higher level than it has been previously. And I think this index, when it's just smooths out all the ups and downs, gives you a better indication as to um, you know, what's happened there in the regional areas. Look, it's great for regional areas. Um, 
and uh, you know the cities have been the losers, but the cities won't be the losers for long because when we open up the international borders, that's where they're actually going to go. So uh, you can see there the um, the the greater capitals and regionals, uh, greater capitals to regions and the regions to capital uh, capital cities. So there's been less migration into the capital cities than we've had previously from the regional. So how's that affected the Brisbane uh, versus Melbourne house pricing? Well, obviously, with all of this population movement um, moving out of uh, Melbourne and into Queensland, it's pushed up prices dramatically. My one little niggling thing underneath here is two things, really. One, is it permanent? Or once Victoria gets some sense and maybe some sensible government, they'll go back. Um, and two is, have we got the jobs in Queensland to actually sustain all of these extra people? Or is it retirees coming here, bringing up their bank accounts? Not sure. And I'll be searching for that information for you shortly. Uh, but certainly, it's, it's one of the factors that has dramatically pushed down the Melbourne population and pushed up the Queensland population, particularly Brisbane. So... Uh, the other thing that is going for Brisbane, of course, is the Olympics, and that is going to have a long-term flow-on effect with infrastructure spending and, and the like. So that's it for me this week. I want to leave you with a little bit of a, a cautionary tale about, um, about fear. Because fear is false evidence appearing real. And that is what you are having shoved down your necks at the moment by mainstream media. All the hype about interest rates and, and the Ukraine and China and everything bad. Well, in actual fact, a lot of that's very good for Australia. So fear is temporary. Regret is forever. Do not let this space in time leave you. Do not let this space in time paralyze you with all of the fear that's out there. You must be taking action because there is a lot more upside in the market. Will it be the heady kind of growth we had in 2021? No. But will it be good growth? Yes. In normal terms? Yes. And if you get paralyzed by all the fear out there, you're going to be the loser. So take up one of my sorry 60-minute uh, real estate breakthrough sessions with one of my advisors and see how we can help you. We don't sell properties. We will help you understand where you're at, what your goals are, and how we can help you with that, how you can actually achieve, the, you know, perhaps even entry into the market. Or maybe it's not entry into the market, maybe it's expansion in the market. And how you can do that and have great cash flow, replace your income, Build a portfolio that you can live on for the rest of your life. So let us help you. All you've got to do is go to iloverealestate.tv forward slash questions forward slash. And one of my advisors will be standing by there to uh, book an appointment. And one of my advisors will be there to have a really good chat to you for about an hour. So that's it for me this week. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll catch you next week. Bye now.